Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're joining with believers all over the world in celebrating the beginning of Advent. And Advent is a time of preparation for the coming of Jesus. And that means that Christmas is not far away. I don't know about you, but I love Christmas. Uh, I love getting the tree up and wrapping presents. I don't like the shopping that much, but I do like wrapping the presents. And I love all the lights and that feeling of expectation of lovely times with family and friends. You know, we have so many hopes and expectations around this uh, time of year. And obviously some of them are going to result in disappointments along the way. In fact, many people dread Christmas altogether for a variety of reasons. But as a follower of Jesus, I just love that we take this time leading up to Christmas <clears throat> to reflect on themes which remind us about what and whom Christmas is all about. So for the next few weeks, <clears throat> we're going to follow a sermon series uh, on the themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy and love. And today we're going to start with hope. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you're here now by your Holy Spirit. And we pray that as we reflect on this topic of hope, we'd be filled with the knowledge that you're always speaking and that we'd expect to hear your voice as we focus on this theme of hope this morning. Our hope is in you, Lord Jesus. Strengthen that hope today, we pray. Amen. So what I'm going to do is try to answer these three questions. What is biblical hope? So on what are we basing our hope? And then how do we appropriate hope? How do we get it? And once we've got it, how do we nurture and care for that hope so we don't lose it and begin to feel hopeless? And before we get into answering those questions, I just want to share with you that my tagline on WhatsApp is uh, my hope in Jesus is an anchor for my soul from Hebrews 6.19. That's a really personal scripture for me because it reminds me of who I was before I knew Jesus, <clears throat> how I was tossed around by every wind of teaching. You know, I was just into a bit of everything. All roads led to God, I thought. So I was just as happy to quote Buddha as Jesus. And uh, then in 1987, I invited Jesus into my life and I made a decision uh, to be his disciple or his apprentice. And then the more I began to know this Jesus, the more I realized that I just couldn't go along with all the random beliefs of most of my friends because I was convinced that Jesus really was and is the only way to God, that he was in fact God incarnate and that he is the way and the truth and the life, as he said himself in John 14, 6. So believing this really did change my life it didn't just change my spiritual beliefs, it changed the way I began to live. And it just brought me such hope and peace and love and joy. Because I felt like I'd finally become me. You know, I wasn't afraid anymore of going against the flow because in the past I just agreed with everybody. And I was quite easily led, I suppose. So my hope in Jesus really is an anchor for my soul. And I'm eternally grateful for that. So the first question I, we're going to answer is what is biblical hope or Advent hope all about? Well, it's about hope in a, per, in a person. Um, in the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, they have two words for hope. The first one is yachal, to wait, like Noah waiting for the flood to subside. And kava, or kav is a, a cord. So when you pull a cord tight, you produce a, a state of tension until there's release. So it's a sense of expectation. So Hebrew hope is about waiting and expectation. But what were they waiting for? Well, as the nation of Israel was sinking, it felt like God was hiding his face. And in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 17, Isaiah says, I will Kava for him. The only hope Israel had in those times was in God himself. And we see the same mention of hope all over the book of Psalms, 
where there are almost 40 mentions of hope. And in almost every case, the people are waiting for God. In Psalm 130, verses 5 to 7, the psalmist says, I wait, I kavah for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope, or my yachal, because he is loyal and will redeem Israel from their sins. So the people of Israel had a hope and an, and an expectancy that a savior, a king, would come to rescue them, to be their hope. So biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism, because optimism is choosing to see how circumstances might work out for the better against the odds. But biblical hope is not based on circumstances. You know, when there's no evidence that things are going to get any better, we choose hope anyway. In the Old Testament, around the year 700 BC, the prophet Isaiah told the king of Judah in Isaiah 7:14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. You know, this was the clearest prophecy they'd had yet, that the promised Saviour would come and deliver his people. And the people of Israel still had many centuries of waiting to come. But these prophecies and others like them about the Messiah, the Christ to come, continued to give the people hope during the long and difficult days ahead. And that prophecy in Isaiah was fulfilled when the Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus that first Christmas morning. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The Virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in the Old Testament, they were hoping for a Messiah and, you know, hope requires that you do not yet have the thing that you hope for. And they were hoping for the coming of Emmanuel, who would give them a different kind of life. So biblical hope is based on a person, the person of Jesus, the hoped for and promised Messiah, the hoped for and promised King, the one hoped for has actually come. And that leads to my second question. How do we appropriate or get this kind of hope? And the answer to that lies in surrender. Surrendering to God's plans. You know, Jesus was God's answer to all the longings of Israel. Uh, but he wasn't at all what they expected. They expected a saviour who would deliver them from Roman occupation. But God had something far greater in mind. He had in mind a completely different kind of life. And as followers of Jesus, we base our hope on his death and resurrection, which sets us free from slavery to sin and offers us a completely new life in him. A life where we have access to the very throne room of the God who created all things. You know, the empty tomb opened up a new door of hope, a living hope, a hope that we can be reborn into new and different humans. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In, he, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So when we choose to follow Jesus, living hope is actually planted in us. And you know, Hope is not an accessory in our lives. It's not something we call upon now and then when we're in trouble. It's actually intrinsic to who we are. When we surrender to Jesus, we become marked by hope. It's part of our identity. We're a people of hope. God is the God of hope. And this hope in us is transforming the world around us. You know, other people are touched by the hope in us even if we don't ever see that. Everything changes. We're no longer at the mercy of everything that happens to us. We're closely anchored to Jesus. And Jesus is repairing and restoring and healing everything that's broken in us 
and around us. That's an image of incredible hope. And as people of hope, we understand that what we see is not the final story. As people of God, we trust that God is at work, is who he says he is, and will do all that he's promised. You know, the apostles believed that what happened to Jesus was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. The humankind and the whole of creation would be liberated from decay and evil and death. Isn't that a lovely thought? And it's true. This new birth or new life starts the moment that we put our life in Jesus and surrender to his will for our lives. Because when we do this, we become new creatures. As C.S. Lewis would say, we're as different as a statue is to a real living and breathing person. So remembering that our hope is in the person of Jesus. We appropriate hope by surrendering our lives and all the plans we have for our lives to Jesus. And we allow him to help us to become the versions of ourselves that we were always meant to be. But you know, hope can dim and fade over time, can't it? So we need to actually nurture it and take care of it. So how do we nurture and care for our hope? Well, what happens to our hope is that we live in a harsh world and we get our hearts broken and we suffer disappointments. So many people have suffered so many disappointments since COVID started. You know, no parties held for big birthdays, no graduation dances, no first year of college with all the opportunities to meet new friends and party with them. Some people's loved ones got very sick and some even died. So many things happen to put our hope at risk. And when hope dims, we become vulnerable. And we sometimes begin to question God's character. We even doubt that he's really Emmanuel, that he's God with us. And then when we do that, we often start making alternative plans for our life in case God doesn't show up or he shows up late, like King Saul did in the Old Testament. So we put our hope in other places. In our career, for example, you know, when I get that job, life is going to be so good. Or when I pass my exams, I'm going to have so many opportunities. And those with families, you know, we can sometimes put our hope in our children and for all the hopes and dreams that we have for them or for the life we'll have once we've met our husband or our wife, if you haven't done that yet. So often we put our hope in our own perfect plans for our lives, and then we ask God to bless where we put our hope. We go, look at this, Lord, isn't this great? Will you bless it? Which is like a child saying at Christmas, Mom, Dad, I can't wait to see what you're going to get me for Christmas. And then they write you a long list and present it to you with all their priorities circled. You know, we do this. We circle all the options we think we have. And then we bring them to God and we say, out of all the options that I've chosen for my life, which one will you choose? You know, here's the catalogue of my life. What will you bless? And we do this instead of saying, okay, Lord, I trust you. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. Will you lead me and guide me into your plans and your purposes for my life? And you know, one of the reasons we do this is because we're often afraid of what uh, God's going to, that God's going to give us something that will make us really unhappy. But as Jesus says, you know, what father gives a child a stone if he asks for bread? It's a lot scarier to surrender to God's plans for us. It's easier to believe that we can see, to believe that what we can see and control is better than believing what we can't see or control. And how we see God affects the condition of our hope. So here are a few uh, simple things we can do to pay attention to our hope and to take care of it. Number one, because we see Jesus as good, we make a decision to trust him and to surrender to God's plans for our lives every single day. And we wait 
and listen for his voice. Number two, we command our souls, or as Tim Keller says, we talk to ourselves. We don't listen to ourselves, we talk to ourselves. In Psalm 42 verse 5, uh, the psalmist gives their soul a bit of a talking to. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. And then if you remember from E's wonderful talk on worship a few weeks back, Psalm 103 is also giving our souls a bit of a talking to. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then the prophet Ezekiel, way back in the Old Testament, uh, was brought to, in Ezekiel chapter 37, God brought him to a valley of dry bones. And God says to him, you know, these are the people of Israel whose hope is gone. You know, when we have no hope in our lives, it can feel like we have dry bones sometimes. Tell those bones, you know, the Lord is going to breathe life into you and you will live. You will live and flourish and thrive. You know, we have to invite God to breathe life into our hope. And we have to tell our dimming hope to live. And then the third thing we need to do is just remember. You know, when hope begins to run thin, we nourish it by remembering. In the big picture of remembrance, we read our Bibles and we remember the stories of what God has done throughout the history of his people. And most of all, we remember what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You know, we see that the Bible regularly invites us to remember. Psalm 42 uh, verse 6 says, yet, yet I will remember. So we look back and we remember what we've seen God do in the past to sustain hope for what's in front of us. And in our lives today, if we can't see God in front of us, then we have to ask, where do we see him behind us? We need to remember what God has said and done in the past and when he was very close because this feeds us hope for what he's going to do now and in the future. You know, our present circumstances can shout very loudly. When things are hard and when we're in the middle of painful times, we can believe things in the moment which are not actually real. It's not reality. So remembering has to become part of our daily and weekly practice. And in the growth group that we've been doing, Lectio 365, we're becoming really familiar with remembering because every night we're invited to remember where God was at work during the day. And we pray this prayer, reflecting on the day that has passed. Lord, show me where you were at work in my life today. In what ways did I experience your goodness? And when did I hear you speak? And this takes thinking about because the answers don't immediately spring to mind. We have to get quiet and we have to think. It's worth remembering where we've seen God lately. You know, last week, last year, two years ago. Did a conflict get resolved? Did we receive answers to prayer? And then be thankful. Uh, keeping a prayer journal and recording our prayers really helps in this exercise of remembering. Because when I go back and remember two to three years ago, I have a much better perspective on how God moves. And it shows me how consistent God has been in the past, which helps me in the present moment, despite the circumstances. And then when we can't remember, we ask God to help us to remember. Lord, help me to remember. Or we can ask someone close to us who knows as well I have a friend who'll often send an email saying, you know, things are really tough right now. Can you stand with me? Can you help me to remember what God has done in the past? We need each other to help remember sometimes. And remembering is in fact a really great discipline for us to practice because it helps us to put things into perspective in our lives and it causes us to see more clearly the character of God the God we know and love, and who loves us beyond our imagining. So hope can dim when life is full of unknowns. You know, when we don't know where our income is coming from next year, 
or where we might be living or whether the, that relationship will thrive or end. You know, where is our hope now? Where is your hope now, today? Is it in what we're planning? Or can we say, Lord, I trust you. I will wait. I put my hope in you and in your plans for my life. You know, I have a tendency to be really impulsive, so I need to say these words to myself and act on them. I will wait. I will wait and expect. I won't rush into doing. I'll trust you with leading me and I'll trust you with the outcome. So during this time of Advent preparation for Christmas, we remember the birth of Jesus and all the ways that Jesus is coming to earth brought life and hope and comfort and joy and peace to the world. And you know, when we sit in silence and we choose to wait in his presence and fix our eyes on this Jesus, our hope really does grow and rise again. Let's pray. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable. So what's the condition of your hope today? Lord, we ask that as we enter into Advent and we're reminded that you are the hope of the world, would you show us the condition of our hope? Our hope is in you, Lord Jesus. Would you breathe life into our hope today? Help us to put our trust in you for every part of our lives because you have proven yourself to be trustworthy and true. Amen.